How about cryptocurrency or maybe starting your own business? You're watching The Sovereign Life with Teresa Stewart on Channel 82. Welcome back to this episode of The Sovereign Life. We are going through the investing blueprint to build generational wealth. And I have my good friend Mandela Fubla here with me. Now, Mandela, before we took the break, you mentioned around having a plan and a notebook and how that can assist with you when you're doing your demo call. Can you elaborate a little bit more on why that's important to actually track what you're doing and what's happening in your account as it's happening? So I find the, the notebook keeps me accountable. Mm. So especially when I start looking at a trade to get into, it could be Bitcoin, it could be Shiba Inu, it could be Dogecoin. I want to know, okay, where am I getting in? Where am I getting out? How much am I risking? And why? Mm -hmm. What is the catalyst? What's causing the, the move? Um, sometimes I forget that because I have other investments or I get so excited when the price goes up considerably. So I can refer back to the notebook and I can say, okay, I was going to get out when Bitcoin hit 69,000 and I can rely on that instead of having my emotions and my excitement take over. And then I think, okay, Bitcoin's already going to 69. Why can't it go to 79 or 89? Um, and then you kind of just play the hoop and pray game. Right. Um, so writing is important, but then reviewing as well, because if you're not going to look back at it, you know, that's, that's half the battle is to actually remember why you got in. Um, and then the other thing I find with writing down stuff is it helps me to remember where I was like at the time. So it could be just a general like, OK, today crypto is doing really well, um, but I want to wait for a dip. And when that dip comes, I want to buy. Um, a lot of people buy at the wrong time when they buy at a high mm -hmm. because they have the fear of missing the move. Um, but nine times out of 10, eventually there's going to be some sort of pullback, some sort of crash. And the stock market's the only place where people actually run for the exits when there's a crash. Everybody wants to buy on Black Friday in the retail stores, but they don't want to buy when the market crashes. And that's the best time to buy. Interesting because the whole idea of buying the dip is definitely something that you hear often, but a lot of people I don't think really understand what that means. So can you just give a quick example of what buying the dip would look like for someone on their first go at buying the dip? So it's hard to time your right. entry, right? So um, you're not going to get dips every day. So I kind of, I, I, I break it down into what phase are we in? So the first question is, are we in a range? So are we kind of sticking within like $10 and, and $5? Or are we trending higher? So are we going 8, 9, 10, 11, 12? Once I identify that, then I try and look for what I call the metagame. And the metagame is what other traders are thinking. So I want to try and jump have a jump on whatever other traders are doing so let's say we're, we're in a range um let's say we're in the middle of the range the average person is probably going to just buy because they don't want to miss out somebody's told them on instagram or TikTok that they need to buy dogecoin uh, because it's going to pop right so they're getting at the middle of the range and most times it'll probably sit there for a bit and it may go down and emotionally in my head i'm thinking from the metagame perspective how is that person feeling as the price is going down? They're probably not going to buy more. They may get out, but I want to try and find a price where they're going to get out. So I'll try and look at other areas of support or other areas where it's turned around. And then I won't get in until the price goes to my target price or my mm -hmm. entry price. Sometimes it takes days, sometimes it takes hours. Um, so that's a that's an example of a simple dip mm -hmm. where it's going down from the market price that you looked at it initially. I've made a note to say the price is at two dollars. And then a day or two later, the price is going from two dollars to 90 cents. So that's where I want to get in. I'll look at my notes and I'll say, OK, we're down. There was a nice dip and I want to start getting in. Perfect. Thank you for that example, because I feel like sometimes it sounds like a really abstract idea when you think about buying the dip if you don't actually have something tangible to kind of work with in your mind. So that example probably made it a little bit easier for those of us that haven't really bought a dip yet to actually establish what a dip could look like for us. Now, you mentioned other traders in that example. And so what are some of the types of traders that are out there and what are some of the characteristics when a person is thinking about getting in to the stock market? and? How can they get into this space and understand like what type of trader they want to be? That's a great question because a lot of people don't think about that aspect of it. They just think they want to make as much money as possible. So 
I keep saying this over and over, everybody's different, everybody has a different um, you know, work obligations, family obligations. So you have to look at what does your day look like? Do you have a full-time job? Are you working shift hours? You know, How much time do you have to commit to it? Um, so I have two um, streams of thought. One is more short-term. Um, I wouldn't say day trading, but it's more like a swing trade. So if I'm looking short-term, it's probably gonna be two, three, four, five days on a trade. Um, and then I have a long-term account, which is more like two, three, four, five years. And when you're looking at what type of trader you wanna be, you have to decide how much time do you have to actually invest into research, into actually placing your trades. If you work a full-time job and you have kids and you have you know very, very little um, free time, it's probably not realistic. You have to be honest with yourself you're not going to be able to, to focus on it as much. Mm-hmm. Um, but let's say you're in between jobs and you work nights, then maybe you can do some day trading where you're spending three, four hours a day trading. Mm-hmm. So um, the main types would be sort of day trading or scalping where you mm-hmm. could be in and out within a few minutes. Then day trading is anything from a day or two. Um, swing trading is a little longer. So you're holding it for a couple days. Um, and then, you know, you get to kind of more like long term, which mm-hmm. is which is it's less stress um, and it's also less time consuming when it comes to like you're not making trades every day on your long term account. Right. And so speaking to that, the characteristics, it seems like obviously the longer term trader you are, the less stress you have. But speaking about the swing trader, the day trader, like what are some of the characteristics that they can expect if they do jump into that space? Like if they do have the time to be a day trader, what are some of the emotional roller coasters they might go through that they, that they can like maybe set themselves up, you know, to expect this and, you know, adjust accordingly? That's probably the one of the biggest secrets to like controlling your risks or being successful in investing. A lot of people wanna know what's the hot thing to buy. Mm -hmm. But when you buy it, you still need to know where to get out or how to get out and when to get out. Um, So managing your emotions, I think, is probably the most underrated, but the most important aspect of being a long-term successful trader. I've spoken to a lot of people who get into it, um, they lose a little bit of money and they're done because Mm. they, they, they don't, have the tools or they, they don't want to spend the time um, working on the mental game, working on the actual, um, the, the, the management of the trade. So um, one of the most important things is um, having that acceptance that you're gonna lose money. Yeah. If you can say, okay, I'm gonna lose money and I'm okay with that. And when you have a loss, being able to accept it and move on like a pro. Mm-hmm. Um, the key is having those losses as small as possible um, so that it's not going to impact your account and you can afford a series of losses. Mm-hmm. So we were going back before it um, mentioned, I think in segment one, about not putting all your cash into one investment. Um, so starting off really small in a position and then saying, okay, if it works out really well, I can always add to it. Mm -hmm. That helps for me psychologically because I'm not so much banking on that one investment going up or going down. Um, Another thing is if you find that the um, the time you're spending is like you're always glued to your screen, you're looking at the, the, the totals every five seconds, you probably have too much invested. You should probably cut it in half or take some off the table, even if you're up. Um, because that's not a life to live. You're not you're not um, present mm-hmm. in your conversations with people mm-hmm. because you're always focused or you're always thinking about have I made a million dollars yet? Basically, right. um, and the notes as well. So the notes come in in handy when you're trying to improve your mental game. Mm-hmm. Um, so what did I think about when I had this trade? And one of the things is having having a plan. So everybody's plan is going to look different. I try and have like everything planned out from step one to step 10 so that when I'm trading, I'm actually like a robot. Mm. I'm not thinking, okay, this is going to go well. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to remove emotion as much as possible. And I'm just going step one, tick, step two, tick, step three, tick. So it's where am I getting in? Where am I getting out? Where are other traders? Um, how much am I going to risk? Where's my stop loss? 
what's what's moving the markets today those mm-hmm. sorts of things um and the, the more you can control or reduce your emotions i think the better you will be in the long term and this applies to anything this is not just um you know crypto um it applies to anything that you're kind of investing in right and so i want to circle back because you mentioned digital assets earlier and i just want to briefly kind of talk about how do we find the best digital asset to get into or even the other types of asset classes as we mentioned because everyone wants to find the next bitcoin i mean everyone wants to find the next thing that they can get in early enough so that when they get that when it does skyrocket they get those great returns so like maybe one or two places that we can kind of go or how do you find that like what does that even look like right um great question so you can pay for information um there are sources um resources that will send you information um so you can get things like if you want to get in on IPOs, um, you can. If you want to get, um, I guess, the, the things that are moving the most in a day. So you can go on like a coin market cap and you can see which coin has moved the most today, this week, this month. And you can kind of gauge it that way. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing that I use is, is podcasts. So I will listen to about 15 to 20 different podcasts and they will give out information in there about what companies have announcements, what's moving, you know, things like conferences. And that gives me a lot, a lot of um, information mm-hmm. about what's popping. Mm-hmm. Um, for myself, I try not to jump on a lot of the hype okay. recently, and that's my personal choice. Um, but if you are looking for like the next big thing, you want to find out, um, you know, what what's going to be the next big thing, you could go on things like Reddit. Mm. Um, you, it, it does take time. Right. Um, and it's, it's just about, um, tr- you can trust but verify as well. Okay. So always make sure before you make a decision that you're doing as much due diligence behind it as well. Um, there's a lot of information that is not always going to be 100% accurate. Right. And um, like there's been, there have been a few investments that I've had, like for example, when um, GameStop was running up mm-hmm. and I wanted to get in, but I was waiting for a dip and my rules were telling me to wait for a dip and it never dipped. Dip, okay. It just went up. So, you know, I accepted that I followed my plan. Mm-hmm. I was kicking myself because um, had I just jumped in, I probably would have made something. I would have at least had some of it. Um, but it also just depends on the type of personality you have. Got you. All great information, Mandela. We're going to actually take a quick break and then we'll be back to wrap this episode up. And we're actually going to get some of Mandela's secret resources that will help us to build that investing blueprint to help us build generational wealth. So you make, make sure you do not go anywhere. We'll be right back. We'll be right back after these messages. Crimson Multimedia is a full service video production company. We can take your next project from concept to completion. We produce small one-camera setups to complex large-scale multi-camera productions. We offer editing, visual effects, and file transfers. We also broadcast and live stream both free and pay-per-view events. Visit our website at www.crimsonmultimedia.bm for a quote or to contact us. Lit Crimson Multimedia. Film, edit, broadcast and stream your next event. You're watching The Sovereign Life with Teresa Stewart on Channel 80 Tip. Welcome back to this episode of The Sovereign Life. I'm Terry Kay with my good friend Mandela Fubler. And we are wrapping up this episode with some of the the keys that you have, Mandela, when it comes to actually setting up the account. Now, you know, we're millennials and we often hear our parents' generation say, if I had gotten started in investing earlier, then mm-hmm. I would be much further along in my investing game than I am today. So let's just talk about, first of all, is there a good number to have set up to get started with your account? Like what's not necessarily the magic number, what's a good comfortable number to kind of get yourself started? So I would say, how much are you willing to start with? And you have to look at your finances, you have to look at what your monthly bills are. Um, But the best advice that I could give is just to start. Mm -hmm. Like I wish that I would have started younger um, and I wish that I would have risked more. Um, And I think a lot of people who are older feel the same way. So anything that you're willing to kind of put aside and say, you know what, I don't need this right now. I could buy a new pair of shoes, I could buy a new top, or I could put this into, you know, into a, a stock that I think is going to be around for the next 20 years and that's going to grow. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's, I guess there's a difference between having a, a large balance to start off with and 
putting a little bit aside each month. So if you if you are willing to put aside, let's say, two hundred, five hundred dollars each month, that's not going to hurt you financially. Um, and you can dollar cost average into an index, which is a lot lower risk, or into one of those staple stocks that you know are going to be around for a long time. Um, if I could probably go back, I would have taken a lot more, a lot more of my my savings or my money that was just sitting in the bank and not collecting any interest because, you know, you want to have a rainy day fund, but you have to be realistic and say, OK, I have enough for a rainy day. This is for growth. Mm-hmm. This is really for me to try and maximize my, my, my mm-hmm. returns. Um, so it, it, it depends. Everybody's different. Everybody has their own sort of life goals. Um, but the best advice that I could give is just to start. Don't come up with excuses. Don't say, oh, I have a trip planned or once I get this amount, because you'll never get it. <laughs> okay, Amanda, you don't have to talk directly to me. Like, I get it. <laughs> but yes, you definitely find yourself talking yourself out of certain things because you want to have this idealistic start to your investing game. And you definitely want to make sure at the, at the very least you're set up in a good way but i definitely hear what you're saying when you say like you know if you can get started today without necessarily hurting yourself financially you should get started but one of the things that i think kind of trips some people up is even if we have the two to five hundred that we can kind of get started with today if we wanted to do dollar cost averaging is how do i even create the account like where do i go to even get started because not like i can just take my 500 and go to the new york stock and say hey i want to buy these socks like how does that kind of process work so there are a few places in Bermuda. Um, I, I just have to be careful about what I say in, mm-hmm. in terms of, you know, um, I don't want to get myself in trouble or anybody else. But there are a few banks in Bermuda that you can go to. You can set up a brokerage account. Um, they do have certain conditions. So I think there's like a minimum. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's also fees. So you don't want to start with $100 and the fees to buy is $50 because that's half of your money right there Gone. out the window. So do your research. Things that I like to look for are, um, you know, what are their fees? That's a big one because they're going to take a percentage. They're a business. They're trying to make money. So where, where, are, your, where are they going to be taking from your capital? Um, there's also crypto accounts or digital asset accounts. So if you're doing things like, <coughs> sorry, buying Bitcoin, that's going to be a different broker. That's going to probably be like a Coinbase or Binance. Um, There's a CEX and all those exchanges work with Bermuda. So you are able to transfer from your Bermuda account into the crypto exchange. And then when you're ready to withdraw, you can send it back to your Bermuda account. Mm -hmm. Um, So in terms of getting started, I would suggest just researching a few exchanges or a few brokerages brokerage accounts. I know some people prefer the Bermuda element where they can actually speak to someone um, if you're not too fussed and you want to reduce, you know, some of that um, the time lag, then you can probably go overseas and look at some of the broker uh, brokerages over there. Mm-hmm. Um, other things I would look at are um, what what's the the feedback or some of the, the comments or criticisms about them. Have people had issues withdrawing the money? That's a big red flag. If you can't get your money out. Um, one thing that I do whenever I set up an account, I test withdrawing. So I'll deposit, let's say I deposit a thousand, I'll try and withdraw twenty dollars. I want to see how fast it gets out and that it gets out and how many uh, how much do they charge in fees. Um, and just start. Like don't don't keep putting it off. Put it on a list and get it done because the faster you set up the account, the faster you can start making money. Okay, Mandela, I hear you. I get it. I I am going to do this in the next couple of days. One of the things you mentioned earlier that I kind of wanted to circle back on was this idea of the digital asset accounts. And okay, because it's very popular right now. I mean, if people aren't talking about digital assets, they're not talking about anything. And so when you are because I feel like that might be a little bit different for people than just the regular stock or brokerage account, because that one is there is an element of it's hard to get into. It's secure. Mm -hmm. There are certain things that are kind of set up for these digital assets that make them a little that make them different from your traditional assets. So what are like what would be the key thing that you should look at when you're trying to determine which digital asset account you want to create like what is like the thing for you to kind of say okay yeah that's the one i want to create my account with okay good question a lot to unpack and i guess the first thing is what do they offer 
So if I want to get Shiba Inu, which is the, one of the new kids on the block, um, does the exchange actually offer that? Not all of them do. A lot of the more like tried and tested ones, like I think Coinbase, for example, they don't offer a lot of the new coins. Um, so just checking the catalog and seeing the things that you want to invest in are available. Um, the next thing I'll probably look at is fees. So how much do they charge for you to buy, sell? How much do they ch charge for you to withdraw or transfer to other accounts? Um, and then another thing I look for is um, their compatibility with Bermuda. There are some um, exchanges that are basically not going to allow you to open up accounts with a Bermuda passport or Bermuda address. So those things will save you time. Mm -hmm. um, and just talking to people, I think also having like a community, if you can, of friends, like-minded people who have done it, maybe have a mentor or a trading coach or like a group that you can bounce ideas off of. Um, one of the things I tell people is I have over 20 years of mistakes <laughs> of investing, of what not to do, of where I went wrong. Um, Bitcoin went from, I want to say, let's say March 2020, Bitcoin crashed. Um, it went down to three grand. And I tried to go to sleep and I couldn't because I just kept thinking about my Bitcoin. So I got up at two in the morning and I sold it, all of it. I had more than three. And then the next morning I looked at it and it was up and it never went to three grand again. So being able to have these conversations with people and to say, yeah, I made a mistake, but you know what? I'm never doing that again. And the next time I feel like selling Bitcoin, I'm going to think twice right. um, and sharing that with people so that the next time um, that happens, someone can say, oh, yeah, I remember that guy on that TV show said, you know, he, he wishes he hadn't he hadn't sold it. Right. Um, so being able to have that human contact, which is rare during COVID uh, or since COVID, we really haven't had that um, and trying your best to kind of just navigate investing. I don't have all the answers, but I'm helping you know, as many people as I can to learn from my mistakes. And I think learning from, not only you learning from your own mistakes, but sharing it with other people to learn from those mistakes is very important because I feel like this space is somewhat guarded. Like getting into investing is not the easiest thing to do because it's not a topic that gets talked about in your education. It's definitely something that genuinely comes out of like these, just we have a connection, we have like-minded conversations. And so that's great. So can we just talk about quickly, why do we think this space is so guarded? Like, why is it that it's very difficult to get into if you don't have $10,000 in a, your capital to get started? Like, why is it so closed off? Yeah, um, it's a tricky one because I think some of it is self-inflicted. So I think a lot of people feel like they don't want to get into investing until they're older. Um, that's an older person's thing. I, I'll think about investing when I'm retired. Mm -hmm. um, but the best time to invest is when you're younger and you have the capital, you have the time to invest and, and, and grow um, as much as possible. Um, I think the other thing is a lot of the institutions that are set up are making money on fees. So they will make more money from someone who is just giving them some money to invest than they would if someone goes overseas, let's say, and is investing on their own. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of a discouragement there. Um, there's a lack of education. So in the school system, you don't have a lot, um, a lot of people focused in on investing specifically. You have people doing MBAs or business degrees or things kind of some overlap. Um, but it, when it gets down to like technical analysis or crypto investing, there's very limited, reliable um, educational resources. Mm -hmm. um, and then I guess the last thing is people are so busy right now. People want um, immediate gratification. So a lot of people don't want to spend the time to read or to listen to podcasts. They want to know what's the ticker symbol? When do I buy? When am I making a grand? Or, yeah. you know, give, just give me the, the, the quick summary. Give me the executive summary um, and I'll do it. I want to know the secret to investing. Tell me. <laughs> um, and it's not like it's, it's just over 20 years. I've kind of learned that the secret is, yeah, it's just hard work. Yeah. It's like delayed gratification is patience. Mm -hmm. It's um, just putting in the time. I mean, like take any any sort of hobby that you have. 
whether it be, let's say it's filmmaking. I used to love filmmaking. Um, I love the studio. Studio brings back some good memories. Um, but you're not going to just buy a camera and be able to make a show. Mm -hmm. You're going to actually have to learn, okay, how do I light the set? How do I edit? How do I get lower thirds? How do I, you know, it's a lot of things that go on in the background to get you to that point. Same with investing. It's going to take a lot of work and you have to accept that mm -hmm. um, if you want to do it right. There are going to be people who, get, who are going to get lucky. Mm -hmm. So you always have someone who is like beginner's luck where you, you have a nice little hundred grand year. Mm -hmm. um, but if you want to be in it for the long haul, then you're going to have to pull up your sleeves. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to do the work just like you would with anything else, any other career. Now, earlier we talked about briefly the emotional part that kind of comes into making an, a, an, a trade. You get yeah. emotionally invested in it. If it goes up or down, yeah. you definitely feel that. Quickly, can you explain like some strategies to kind of keep your mindset and your emotions in check outside of just doing the journaling? Because I know there are some other techniques that we can do to kind of keep us so that we don't just go sell that Bitcoin at 2 a.m. in the morning yeah. and then kick ourselves later. Worst decision. And you know, the funny thing was my wife actually told me to wait until the morning. And she was like, you know what? Maybe you just want to think about it. And I was like, what do you know? Like, I'm, I'm going to do this. This is, this is my decision. And anyway, um, so yeah, I, I always listen to her. <laughs> Um, since, that, one. since that day. Um, so some of tech techniques. So one of the things I like to do is instead of just jumping in, like impulse buying, I will intentionally take at least one hour of thought and to kind of watch what's happening. Because I find even if I wait an hour and it goes up or it goes in my direction, I can still make a more educated and informed decision. If it goes down after that hour, then I'm getting a discount, I'm getting a better price. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that I do sometimes is um, I'll try and look and see what other people are posting online. Um, and I usually do the opposite mm -hmm. of whatever they're doing. Um, right. That's a kind of a nice trick. Or whatever CNBC is saying, do the exact opposite um, because chances are they're probably late to the party and everybody's already made their money. Mm -hmm. um, resources wise, um, I would suggest like podcast like um, there's one called um, pre market prep. Yeah. So that's every day they give you maybe 30, 40 symbols that are in play or that are topical. So it could be earnings announcements. It could be CEOs um, doing things. Um, it just gives you a pulse mm -hmm. on what's happening. Um, and it's a free resource. Mm -hmm. um, the only other thing I would say is, is actual like I was talking about the hard work mm -hmm. screen time. So you actually looking at charts is helpful mm -hmm. because you can rely back on it later and say, OK, I remember the last time it spiked up like that. It went right back down like the Eiffel Tower mm -hmm. and I lost money. So I'm not going to chase it again. Mm -hmm. So just put it in the time and trying to learn from your mistakes as hard or as as silly or simple as that sounds. I think that's one of the keys to kind of being successful in the long term. And as we wrap up, Mandela, I know you have you've mentioned podcasts and books this whole episode. So do you have any other specific books and podcasts that you want to recommend? Because I do know that if someone is watching this episode, they're definitely like, okay, what podcast should I listen to besides pre-market prep? Right. Okay. So one that I like is Market Huddle, um, Kevin Muir and uh, Patrick Ceresna. Mm -hmm. They do a lot more stocks based, but it's it's good quality and they, they have experience in the industry. Um, the other ones I like are um, Macro Voices. Mm -hmm. So that's more like big picture, long term investing, like what themes are doing well, more like three, four years, uh, sorry, three, four months. Um, if you're looking at that sort of longer term perspective. Um, books wise, the Market Wizards books, it's good for psychology. And then the last one I'm reading now is called The Mental Game by Jared Tedler. Um, and it focuses only on your mental, um, basically your mental strength. So when you're trading, how are you managing that trade? Are you getting in or out, um, you know, uh, at the right times? Mm -hmm. And how to improve on your mental strength. Those sound like all great resources, Mandela. I am grateful to you for that because I'm going to make sure I go purchase them and listen to some of this. Thank you so much for watching this episode of The Sovereign Life. We just share with you the Invest in Blueprint to build generational wealth. And one thing you can make sure you do is share this episode with someone in your circle because we all need to be having this conversation with each other more frequently because that is how we're going to build generational wealth. Thanks so much for watching this episode and we see you in the next one. You've been watching The Sovereign Life. Hope you enjoyed the show.